This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And Heidi, I think the key word today, or one of the key words, could be caution because traders are certainly a little bit on edge after this uh, unprecedented attack by Iran on Israel at the weekend. Yeah, and the sort of uh, narrative of this attack is really interesting, right? Because on the one hand, it does in, in so many ways bring us closer to the brink of further escalation across the region. On the other hand, the sort of calibration, the fine tuning of this attack uh, and how it was intercepted also leads us to a scenario where potentially uh, there is room for, for, you know, both sides to be able to, to kind of uh, move back a little bit to show some restraint. But we continue to watch that situation. Interestingly, no, the, when it comes to the lack of the moves in the yen, uh, something that we're watching very closely, Bell. Yeah, absolutely. Just, uh, just again, as you said, that amount of calibration, perhaps we're not seeing such an outsized reaction so far from investors in the early part of trade. As you said, the Japanese yen, for instance, not perhaps acting in line with other haven assets, we're still holding at that 153 mark. Uh, what else we're tracking in the session so far is the picture for equities, and you are seeing the Nikkei, the topics, both of these declining at the start of trade, but that could also be a bit of a function of, of the U.S. session on Friday, uh, given that we did see a little bit of weakness there as well. Uh, but that's the state of play. Japan, to notice, we just also had some eco data dropping. That was the core machine orders and coming in a lot better than what economists had been tipping for. So the month-on-month -month reading, it was a jump of 7.7%. The estimate had been for 0.8% instead. Let's change now, take a look at the market open for Korea here at the start of the day. Again, a little bit of weakness coming through. You're seeing that more in the tech-heavy Kozdak index instead of 1.3%. Uh, we are continuing to track some moves here in the Korean won. So, again, a bit of weakness against the dollar. But uh, we are starting to, to, to also check any sort of lines we get. In. And some of what we're hearing is that Korea is planning to take steps against excessive volatility in its FX and in its markets as well. Uh, but those uncertainties we're hearing are, are rising due to increased tensions in the Middle East. That's coming from the finance minister in a meeting earlier today, Heidi. And about the increased tensions as we wait for really the Israeli response if and when it comes and what shape it takes form in uh, are really being expressed through the likes of gold right that's really kind of been the main haven and uh, that's also where we see some of the biggest moves or the positive moves for the start of trading here in Australia it is a staggered open so we'll wait to see uh, a little bit more of what the picture looks like but it does look like broader downside except for the miners that's also getting a boost by the fact that iron ore is continuing to gain we have uh, the Chinese data coming out this week suggesting that the first quarter numbers could be actually quite positive, whether that comes at an expense of, of course, a bit of front loading uh, and that affects the second quarter numbers is also a risk. But we are seeing more upside as a result of optimism over the Chinese economic uh, recovery story. And that's feeding through to iron ore, which saw about a 10 percent gain in the previous week and continuing to add to gain. So we are seeing materials and miners, some of the few uh, points of leadership here in Australia. Uh, the Aussie dollar is pretty steady 6476 we've seen mixed trading for the for the US dollar but of course that further upside risk if there is more geopolitical escalation there we will see that move across the US dollar index as well as uh, for potentially further gains in oil and of course across US treasuries there as well uh, treasury futures have been ticking lower so far in the Asian sessions these Middle East tensions of course top of mind for traders that uh, balancing of that risk off haven bid against the path for interest rates as well and the inflation picture, Bill. And Heidi, you mentioned those moves we're seeing in Aussie miners. Well, part of that could also be what we're seeing with metals so far. Uh, we're actually seeing a spike here for aluminium, nickel and copper. They're surging. Uh, we've got uh, the reasons behind that uh, fairly well understood at this point in time. Actually, we got some new US and UK sanctions that were issued and they're essentially banning deliveries of any Russian supplies produced but after midnight on Friday. And so uh, we've spoken to more than two dozen market participants about this, and, and this jump had been very much predicted. The, the question is whether this is something that persists
this over the longer term. There is some disagreement here because uh, some argue that removing one of the largest producers, that's Russia, from the market is going to be something that drives prices higher. Others uh, are more focused on the prospect of a flood of Russian or old Russian metal that's still permitted and that's getting dumped possibly or could get dumped onto the LME. But certainly a story we're tracking this morning, aluminium, nickel, copper surging after US and UK imposed sanctions on any new Russian supplies produced after midnight on Friday. So that's uh, that in response, of course, to that conflict. But let's move to the other one that we're tracking this morning, and that's uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying Washington doesn't want any escalation in the Middle East while continuing to support Israel's right to self-defense. Bloomberg Balance of Power anchor Joe Matthew joins us from Washington. And uh, Joe, how much of, of the, the, the chance of further escalation, of course, really hinges on the response that we get from Tel Aviv. But uh, Tel Aviv can also claim some sort of victory here. They might not want to have something that really risks a broader retaliation. Well, absolutely. Just imagine if we were sitting here talking on Friday uh, about an actual strike by Iran on Israeli soil or directly targeted to Israel. You would think that the markets would be in disarray uh, today. And obviously, we're looking at a very different scenario. The lack of damage, the lack of casualties has really left us in a scenario that we might not have considered here, having seen a remarkable round of defense. Uh, Israel, with the help of the U.S., the U.K., and France, knocking down 99 percent of the hardware that was thrown at it. These, this is over 300 missiles and rockets. So the Israelis could, you know, want to limit their uh, retaliation to something that's more pinpointed, more uh, proportionate, I suppose. But there's a real question there as Benjamin Netanyahu faces a lot of pressure on his right, domestically speaking, not just the U.S. pressuring him uh, to try to reconsider something here. The president did talk to him today, Joe Biden, to urge restraint. But look, we're hearing uh, a lot of different messaging coming out of this White House. A statement from the president said that he spoke with Benjamin Netanyahu to reaffirm America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel, while The New York Times also reports tonight that the president told him that if Israel were to respond to Iran with a direct military strike, the U.S. would not support a move like that. So we're going to have to see what happens in the next 24 to 48 hours to figure out this next move for both governments. Joe, we're also hearing beyond uh, from the U.S. and, of course, we heard from uh, Beijing as well through their ambassador to the U.N. From that G7 leaders summit, we're hearing, according to a person with familiar uh, knowledge of those discussions, that all leaders agree to use all channels of influence on Israel to convince them not to launch a retaliatory attack. So mm -hmm. I, I do wonder how that plays out in terms of, as you mentioned, Netanyahu, who has a lot of domestic uh, pressure at the moment, but we're also seeing a lot of pressure on uh, Western leaders in terms of how support Absolutely. has really waned for the operations in Gaza. Absolutely. And Joe Biden knows about that personally, which is why he was also on the phone today uh, with the leaders on Capitol Hill to try to move a funding bill that could be threatened by uh, a, certainly an over-the-top response by Israel, if maybe any response. There's already uh, opposition by progressive Democrats in Washington to funding Israel. And if that bill is tied to one to fund Ukraine, it could jeopardize both of them. So Joe Biden is walking uh, a, a very narrow line here, both domestically and internationally, as he tries to tame the response by Israel and move this bill now. The Speaker of the House is expected to bring that to a floor to the floor this week, but it's unclear what form that will take or whether they have a path to pass it. Bloomberg Balance of Power anchor John Murphy there with the latest. And let's bring in Jonathan Panikoff, who's a director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. He previously served as a deputy national intelligence officer for the Near East at the U.S. National Intelligence Council. Jonathan, great to have you with us. And in so many ways, yes, the attack over the weekend or the, the retaliation over the weekend was unprecedented. But even the way that this has been choreographed and structured and, uh, you know, forward advancement that we saw of this this potentially happening over a week ago. How unusual was the way that this played out? Great to be with you. I mean, it certainly was novel. It's the first time that we saw this, and I think that was certainly intentional. I think the Iranians really were trying to ensure that they were able to retaliate in a way that is different, more fulsome, um, more robust 
and really over the top in a way we've never seen from them to try to create a level of deterrence against the Israelis. But at the same time, you saw warning after warning. It wasn't clear what the retaliation was going to be. But it was clear that Iran and the way they went about this really was trying to ensure that this ended, that, that there wasn't a response. They're hopeful that there's not going to be a response. I'm skeptical that Israel will oblige that desire. But nevertheless, I, I think Iran was very intentional in how it conducted this action. And you talked about the type of action will determine the type of response and whether this is uh, the end of it. What is your, I guess, best assessment as to what comes next, what the Israeli response will be? Look, right now what we're hearing is the Israeli war cabinet is quite split. There's been some who are against uh, the defense minister, perhaps Gallant, uh, Benny Gantz, the opposition leader. Obviously Netanyahu has significant pressure to his right, as Joe just pointed out. I think if there's going to be a response, my guess is it's going to be something that's pretty small, that's precise, that's really aimed at trying to avoid another Iranian response to whatever is really retaliation is coming. Whether that's going to be sufficient to stop Iran, I think is less clear, especially if you were to see multiple casualties. And that's where you get into this real danger of an escalatory spiral of a back and forth. Are we likely to see uh, Hezbollah, do you think, join Hamas in fighting Israel here? Well, we've already seen Hezbollah actually respond um, this morning that there were some attacks um, Sunday morning here in Washington. And you also saw what I thought was really interesting, Hezbollah taking shots against Israel in the north that were at a much greater intensity on Friday, the day before this happened. So, look, I, I think if Iran feels it has no choice but to escalate this war, then yes, I think Hezbollah is going to get involved simply because Iran has no a feeling that Hezbollah is the crown jewel for them. In other words, they are the pointy end of the spear. And if Hezbollah doesn't attack and Israel recognizes that a full war is coming and Israel takes out Hezbollah, then they're wasted. And so it's this really dangerous game of escalation and, and tit for tat that it's possible. But again, I think the more um, specific and small you could see re Israel retaliation or not at all, it probably keeps Hezbollah in the same area they've been for six months now, just tit for tat across the border with Israel. Israel has a lot of different tools at its disposal to, to repel any sort of attack beyond the Iron Dome. But, of course, groups like Hezbollah have more than 100,000 missiles and rockets at their disposal. What sort of attack can Israel withstand here? Well, if you had an attack that was a full-scale attack from Hezbollah, and let's say at the same time Iran was also attacking, and you had attacks from Shia militants in Iraq and Syria, in other words, the multi-front war President Biden has definitely been trying to prevent for months now, then I think Israel is going to have some success. We saw what their um, arms, uh, their defensive maneuvers and mechanisms can do with David Sling and the arrow systems last night, of course, Iron Dome. But it's hard to imagine that they're going to be able to stop everything. And if it's a lo elongated period, not just five hours like last night, then there's going to be significant damage. You're going to have damage to the offshore gas platforms that are almost certainly going to be targeted. There's concerns that Demona, that is supposedly Israel's nuclear sites, would be targeted. And, of course, Israeli military bases. It's going to be hard to prevent uh, military casualties, let alone civilian casualties, in that circumstance. Jonathan, how much appetite do you think there is when it comes to U.S. involvement? Obviously, the politics are complicated. It's an election year. There's already, you know, diminishing support uh, when it comes to what's playing out in Gaza. I think the U.S. is desperate and has actually been pretty consistent here to keep this from escalating. The one of the two major goals the U.S. had when everything in Gaza started after October 7th was to ensure that there was not a regional war. Um, the second goal, of course, was to support Israel. 
But the U.S. has already messaged that they're not going to support Israeli offensive attacks against Iran, specifically because they're trying to prevent a conflict from escalating and becoming region-wide. So I think you would see the U.S. continue to provide as much as defensive support as needed and as possible if there was additional Iranian retaliation. But I think it's unlikely that you're going to see President Biden sign up to actually undertake um, offensive attacks in a war against Iran unless it was absolutely so critical that Israel itself um, had no choice and its existence was really at stake. All right, that was Jonathan Panikoff there, director at the Atlantic Council. And just some breaking news as well, crossing the terminal in the last couple of minutes. Apple shipments to China getting an update on what we've seen in the first three months of the year. And so far, the data coming through from IDC shows a drop of nearly 10 percent in this period. Of course, China, or this is global rather, the global iPhone shipments falling nearly 10 percent in the first quarter. Of course, a lot of those going to China. and We've seen very weak demand coming through so far. Actually, some of the data, for instance, over the month of February, seeing a drop of around 33%. But certainly, it is that question of how Apple can contain or keep its, its, its market share when it is losing ground to, to local rivals in China and also just Androids overall. So that is what we're seeing here. Data coming through from Market Tracker IDC. And we are seeing some of those Apple supplies a little bit under pressure. What else we're tracking this morning is the metals story here. We're actually seeing uh, some big gains at the open here for trading of aluminium, nickel, copper on the LME. So that's at 1 a.m. local time in London. But what's happened is we've got new U.S. and U.K. sanctions. They're banning deliveries of any Russian supplies produced after midnight on Friday. The question, of course, is how long this lasts. Uh, given removing one of the larger producers from the market, that could drive prices higher. On the flip side, there's also that prospect of a flood of Russian, old re Russian metal getting dumped instead on the LME. But that is the state of play. Another story we're tracking here this morning as we continue to monitor the reaction to Iran's unprecedented strike on Israel at the weekend. So we'll have more to come on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. We are just heading through the morning session here in Asia, uh, tracking the market reaction we're seeing to Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel over the weekend. Uh, so far, we're really seeing traders seeming to take this a little bit in their stride. We have seen a slight move to some of the more safe havens, but broadly, uh, we're, we're fairly range-bound at this point in time. Equities-wise, we're actually seeing quite a bit of weakness creeping through so far. If you took a look at the IMAP function, for instance, for the broader gauge, the MXCI Asia Pacific Index, every sector barring energy at this point is in the red. And we're also seeing uh, some losses coming through for Korea in particular. The cost be there down 1.4%. It's actually now erased all of its year-to-date gains. But let's get more on the market outlook. Bring in Max Bonduri, who's CEO at SCG, SGMC Capital. And Max, I'm curious for your views. Yeah, the, the reaction so far is fairly muted, but how much more closely are you going to be tracking geopolitical tensions now? Well, this is going to be the main risk going forward for markets and for asset valuations overall. So clearly, this is going to be the main thing to be watching on for the coming days. Of course, headlines risk is going to be uh, particularly high with respect to what, if any, uh, reaction from Israel is going to be. And especially after a strong first quarter of the year, uh, these headlines could bring in a little bit of a risk off and a desire from global investors to start taking some profits after a good strong start. And therefore, we need to continue monitoring all of that because it's going to be extremely relevant and crucial with respect to asset valuations going forward. Um, we all hope, of course, that things do not escalate so we can see a bit of a continuation with respect to the positive mood of the first quarter. So what, what reaction or, or which area are you, are you tracking the most? Are you most concerned, for instance, that we see elevated oil prices and that pressures the Fed in turn to say high for longer given that greater inflation risk? Which area are you tracking most closely? 
Well, the first thing is, of course, any clear evidence of a risk off scenario coming in. So you have to look at yen. Is it going to be strengthening? You have to look at gold. Is that going to be strengthening as well? And you have to look at VIX, right? So these are the clear first signals that you have to look at. Then you have to look at how U.S. interest rates move. But of course, you have to discern between the noise of what is happening and with respect to the Fed directives going forward on interest rates. Uh, but the key thing with respect to strong reaction in the short term is really looking at those clear risk of factors. Now, uh, if you look more at the medium term, then you have to start looking at, of course, what the Fed is saying and what the interest rates are going to be doing. But from a growth and a pure microeconomic and macroeconomic perspective, we remain very constructive. So you've seen the numbers coming out being very strong, whether that's in growth, the GDP, whether that's in employment. Also, with respect to the numbers per se and earnings of the companies, they've been quite strong. So from an economic front, we're not worried. Actually, we're quite constructive. It is really going to be about whether these geopolitical tensions could do derail uh, the current bull market, and if yes, for how long and um, how material is the potential correction going to be? Well, this is a market that keeps looking for excuses to rally, right? Even in the face of uh, dwindling Fed cut expectations and, uh, you know, if some pretty uh, t tenuous signs of a recovery in China. Uh, are you optimistic beyond just what we continue to see as sheer confidence in this market? We remain constructive because we feel that with respect to the growth, as mentioned, with respect to the numbers and how companies are positioning, and of course, if you're looking at this whole AI revolution, semiconductors revolution, everything that is going to be carrying forward these names, we remain constructive, but of course, you have to be selective. Constructive doesn't mean that everything is going to be going up, but in terms of potential and in terms of um, way forward for some of the names that, that we have mentioned and some of the themes that I have just mentioned, we think that that could definitely keep going. And you've seen that through with respect to the overall strength and breadth of the market rally so far. And uh, it really going, goes to be seen whether that is going to be uh, put at a halt with respect to geopolitical tests that we have seen now. But in terms of, of numbers, we are confident. And we don't think the fact that the Fed uh, is now looking at only two or three cuts, depending on what the data comes, is going to be a big hit to the markets. Because look at um, just how the market has taken that easily. So at the beginning of the year, they were expecting seven cuts. They're not expecting two to three cuts. And where is NASDAQ and where is the S&P? Definitely higher than where it was at the beginning of the year. So the Fed and what they're going to do is not the only only story here. Uh, Max, of course, we've seen these big moves when it comes to metals, both precious and industrial, big moves across aluminium, for example, uh, nickel as well. But now Goldman Sachs, when it comes to this gold rally that we continue to see building, raising their year in gold forecast by 17% to 2700 US dollars an ounce. Are you expressing this through any kind of uh, investment conviction at this point, through gold miners or in any, any other way? We like this mostly with respect to a diversification and a bit of a hedge. Uh, in terms of gold per se, especially in an environment where interest rates remain elevated, we're not particularly bullish, but uh, this is definitely a diversification asset class which can do well in case of increased tensions like we have seen, and just a, as a bit of a hedge with respect to inflation, which we have seen remain stickier than what most people predicted at the beginning of the year. And that is actually why gold has been doing quite well with respect to, of course, the overall demand for it. Uh, but in terms of playing it going forward, uh, we don't like it per se in terms of having an outright bullish call on gold or any of the gold miners. We really see it in terms of a diversification and hedge strategy for portfolios. Max, always great to have you with us. Max Bonduri, CEO at SGMC Capital. Want to come here on Daybreak Asia? This is Bloomberg. From our point of view, this operation is over and there's no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. That was the chief of staff of Iran's armed forces there speaking on state TV on Sunday.
Uh, take a look at Asian stocks. We're seeing some degree of caution there. Pretty muted moves there across the board. We are seeing a stronger degree of losses uh, being caught by Japanese equities at the moment. The Nikkei 225 down by 1.6 percent. But this, of course, as we really uh, have seen uh, quite a steady stream of gains over the past few sessions and that yen weakness continuing to hold past that 153 level there as well, uh, not really being seen as an expression of uh, certainly a haven uh, demand there. The cost be down by just about 1 percent there. All of this is tracking that fall we've seen in U.S. equities. Markets are continuing to grapple with the ratcheted tensions, the unprecedented retaliation that we saw from uh, Iranian soil to Israel over the weekend. Here in Australia, we're seeing a little bit more of a, a kind of contained downside. Some of those gold miners in particular, as well as industrial metals, seeing gains and we're seeing that uh, really curbing perhaps some steeper losses across the broader index there. New Zealand there off by 1 percent. We had some uh, fairly dismal I I data when it comes to the services sector, uh, the biggest contraction in about two years. And speaking of gold, this is a picture across the uh, havens. Uh, that we're tracking. Their gold futures actually falling now by about a tenth of one percent there. But of course, we have this seen this you know, truly the gold rush of gains that we've seen across a, pre a precious metal. And that I guess spe speculative froth is being seen a little bit uh, as we see the reaction to the attack on Israel. Uh, the drop and the rebound and then the drop again, really, I guess, seeing uh, what we're seeing, some of the volatility there across precious metals. Bitcoin is another one that we're watching there to that extent. The US dollar pretty muted at this point. Uh, there are suggestions that the US dollar index could head higher to about 1270 if we see an escalation, perhaps a retaliation that we're waiting for from uh, the side of Israel in terms of uh, response and, and how that response might uh, take take shape as well. Uh, oil is the other asset that we're watching and traders have so far kind of shrugged off that attack on Israel by Iran over the weekend. Gains holding in check by signs that the conflict will remain to a large extent contained. Our all market reporter Sharon Cho joins us now. So the fact that we're seeing not too much of a response in crude, what do we make of that? Yes, I think um, a lot of people were surprised this morning. Um, oil has been pretty much muted this morning. And although the trading volumes are higher than normal, um, you know, uh, it's not really seeing much of a move. And the Iran's attacks were unprecedented, and it was the first of its kind, but um, it didn't really affect supply for now. So I think um, that's what the response that, that's the response that we're seeing at the moment. And Iran has said that it's pretty much concluded with this attacks. So although it did warn that um, it will retaliate if um, Israel or the U.S. Um, you know gives a strong retaliation against this attacks. But also, uh, Iran has made clear it's concluded, and also Israel um, is told the U.S. it's made clear that it's not looking for any significant es escalation. And also, the Biden administration is telling Israel to take the win. So I think all the situation currently um, doesn't really point to a significant escalation in terms of conflict. That doesn't mean that there will be no escalation. But at least for now, um, the prices are pretty much calmed at this moment. So, Sharon, given that level of calm, what are analysts, oil traders and analysts, most worried about then? I think, you know, um, any strong reaction from Israel is like the most concerning things for oil traders and analysts at this moment. And, um, you know, any flare up of tensions and this becoming a broader um, regional war in the Middle East is going to be a very significant risk factor if it does come about. Um, so far, you know, um, any attacks on oil producing assets or, um, you know, uh, the blockage of the Strait of Hormuz, which, you know, uh, a fifth of the world's uh, seaborne, uh, you know, cargo shipments flow through. If there's any kind of blockage of that strait, then it's going to be a really big risk for the oil market. And we have seen over the weekend that there was a container ship that was contained, that was um, seized by Iranian, uh, uh, Iranian forces. And if we continue to see something like that, that was because it was considered to be linked with Israel. But if that continues to happen, then I think the oil market is going to seriously consider this risk and it's going to you know, result in a risk, uh, 
a surge in geopolitical risk premiums. All right, that was our oil market reporter, Sharon Cho, there. And just as we continue to track what's happening in the oil markets, we're also keeping a close eye on metals in turn because big moves that we're seeing this morning across the board for aluminium, copper, nickel here. But look at that move that you've got there for aluminium. This is the listing on the LME, but it's jumping by the most since 1987. Uh, this is a response to the new curbs that were put in place by the US and the UK. Essentially, what they are doing is banning deliveries of any Russian supplies produced after midnight on Friday. And so that is leading to these big price swings that you're seeing here. As we've been discussing, the key question is how long we see this sort of spike lasting in the markets. Because on the one hand, you've got some that are arguing that removing one of the largest producers from the market is going to drive prices higher. Others, though, are more focused on the prospect of a flood of old Russian metal because that's still permitted and that could in turn get dumped on the LME in response. So at this point in time, we are seeing this spike coming through here. As we said, that biggest jump for aluminium since 1987. Big moves to so copper, nickel, uh, gold, of course, tracking more to, to what happened with Iran and Israel. But still, big moves that you're seeing here. The question is how long those last. We'll have more to come on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Chairman Chancellor Olaf Scholz has begun his second visit to China since taking office. He is expected to deliver the delicate message that Beijing has not acted on European warnings to end discriminatory business practices. For more, let's bring in the EU Chamber of Commerce in China, President Jens Eskeland. Jens, great to have you with us. And obviously, there's, there's going to be one major message, and we saw it uh, also being delivered by Janet Yellen on her recent trip. Uh, how effective do you think this messaging is going to be in terms of persuading Beijing to work on the overcapacity issue? First of all, uh, I should say that we very much welcome that uh, Scholz is, is coming now. Uh, we believe it's getting urgent. We can already see how tensions are beginning to spill over in, in several sectors. We saw, of course, first on October 7th, the EV probe. Then we have seen wind, we have seen solar and so on. And we are afraid that more might be coming. And that is, of course, an expression of the fact that there are some very, very serious imbalances in the relationship. And I think it's important that we have senior Europeans coming to China and impress upon the Chinese leadership that something needs to change. Because it is a little bit like seeing a slow motion traffic accident uh, uh, unfolding. It means we still have time to, to, to fix it, but time is running out. And we hope that Charles will be delivering that, uh, that message that now it's time to look for solutions. We cannot continue the way it is uh, right now in terms of seeing this increase in uh, imbalances uh, across the board. Jens, what are you hearing on the ground from, from your membership, right? Is it a concern? Are you seeing sort of uh, worries about the deterioration of this relationship and what it could mean for European businesses operating in China? I think actually the major concern right now for our members um, is the state of the uh, domestic economy and the low level of consumption that we are seeing here, low level of consumption growth. And of course, the corollary to low consumption growth in China is that more will have to get exported because if you cannot sell it at home, you need to go abroad. It's of course also pressuring uh, our members on their markets and, and we have just collected data from our 1800 members and 75% of them are saying that they are actually right now seeing a decrease in their margins and 36% are indicating that they're seeing overcapacity in the industry and a further 10% uh, indicating that they see it on the horizon. So, you know, 50% more or less of our members uh, seeing oil capacity, 75% seeing decreasing markets. And of course, that's a concern. And the message really that, that needs to get past is, you know, I think there's enough supply out there. Maybe it's time to look a little bit uh, at the demand side. I'm, I'm curious, given the businesses that you speak to, what is the, the level of commitment to putting new capital uh, to work inside China in terms of expanding operations on the ground, for instance, given these, this sort of heightened geopolitical tension situation? I mean, uh, European businesses are not running for, for the exit, but it depends uh, very much on what type of uh, company you are. 
if you are a big multinational for whom China is uh, an existential market, then you will con continue to invest. And so many exciting things are happening right now in China that if you want to stay comp competitive on a global scale, you simply need to be here. The ones that we see uh, being squeezed right now are the uh, SMEs in particular. A lot of them are feeling that they might need over time to have two separate supply chains, one for China and one for the rest of the world. And a lot of these SMEs simply will not have neither the, the bandwidth nor the capital to run two separate uh, supply chains. So our, our concern is that China is missing out, and Europe for that matter, on SMEs uh, uh, being in uh, China. SMEs are sort of the backbone of the European economy. So this is something that will be felt in China and, and in Europe. And I think this is something that China needs to be uh, alert to. Something that just came out in the, in the last few minutes is the shipment numbers for Apple. And actually, we saw globally uh, Apple's iPhone shipments plunging 10% in the first quarter of the year. Uh, part of that is the China story because we've definitely seen a drop-off in demand for, for Apple iPhones. Uh, uh, part of that also driven by this preference for local brands and local players. Uh, German companies at risk of that as well, that increasing trend we see for Chinese nationals to prefer brands that are from China? I think this is a big part of uh, the concern that companies uh, have. That We have seen uh, a very significant effort to engage in import substitution and become more self-reliant. And we have, you know, we have seen in China that over the past five years, maybe the economy overall has grown by 20 percent, 30 percent or so. But actually, imports from Europe uh, have been declining. Uh, and that is, of course, a, a concern. While at the same time, even though uh, uh, we can see in statistics that it seems that exports to Europe are not really increasing in value terms, we actually still see an increase in the uh, in volume terms. And that's, of course, also an expression of deflationary pressure that simply you can get most of for, uh, for less money. And that's, of course, putting companies under, under, under even more pressure. But I, I think it's, it's mind-boggling to think about, you know, last year, Exports to China were actually only 23% larger than exports to Switzerland. Switzerland is an economy with 8 million, million people there, 1.4 here. So something really is, is out of uh, balance. And the fact also that we, during a period over the past five, six years, where we have seen growth in China, significant economic growth, that we actually have a decline uh, in uh, export numbers from Europe. It does mean, of course, if you are in China, for China, you may benefit from it. But if you're a company in Europe exporting to China, definitely it has become harder. And we have seen a decline uh, in export volumes. Yeah, and separate to some of the geopolitical tensions that uh, no doubt are going to dominate uh, Schultz's visit, have you seen, uh, I guess, signs that policymakers and the business environment has gotten easier or perhaps more amenable uh, for overseas partners because of the economic slowdown? Do you think there's more willingness to kind of appe appease or appeal to foreign investors now? We have seen initiatives uh, such as the 24 measures that were released by the State Council uh, back in, uh, in August last year that, if implemented in a meaningful way, would uh, really make a difference for foreign companies. We have seen a little bit, but I think in substance we still need uh, to see it really make a difference. And at the end of the day, uh, the proof is in the pudding. We need to see those, uh, those figures uh, change. And again, when we think about it, most of the content of these 24 measures are related to foreign businesses already in China. It's not if you sit in Europe and are exporting uh, to China. So I think actually, uh, in all fairness, a, a number of our members that are in China are seeing some progress. I think the picture is a little bit more pessimistic if you're sitting uh, in Europe and are trying to export uh, uh, to China. And that is something that China also needs to be vigilant to, that this is something that's increasingly in, in focus. You cannot have a relationship basically where it's only a one-way trade and where you can say actually effectively China is decoupling from Europe, whereas Europe is becoming ever more dependent on, 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 on China. So slightly different perspective depending on whether you're a European company in China or you're sitting in Europe and uh, exporting to uh, China.
All right, that was the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China President Jens Eskelund in Beijing there. And a quick check on what's happening in FX markets so far today. Uh, we are keeping a particular watch on that bit of dollar strength that's coming through. Uh, we have seen it trading higher against many of its counterparts so far this morning, even though actually you're seeing a bit of more move back into the Aussie dollar. That could be perhaps a bit of a, a strength that we're seeing in some of the mining names as well, metals in particular. But uh, what we are tracking is the yen, uh, whether we're going to see any sort of further intervention risk coming through, any further jawboning, because we're still holding at that 153 mark. And speculative yen shorts as well, they've actually hit a record high. Uh, that is given that in the longer term, higher resource prices, the resulting worsening of Japan's, Japan's trade balance, that could lead to a weaker Japanese currency. And as well, of course, the flow on is that it could exert upward pressure on consumer prices. But that's what we're hearing from Mitsubishi UFJ so far in the session, Heidi. Yeah, and uh, Bill, we're, it's interesting when you take a look at how uh, U.S. Treasury trading is playing out, right, in terms of that haven aspect that we typically see. It does seem like they're kind of uh, falling short of perhaps the more dire cases that was being priced in going into the end of last week. And also, even in reaction to the unprecedented uh, moves from Iran towards Israel over the weekend, uh, potentially looking like we could see yields going higher this week if these tensions kind of remain at the levels that we are seeing now, which would obviously reduce that haven uh, case even more. We have really seen futures declining as uh, investors are also continuing to price in what happens with oil, uh, the risk of further escalation, does that push up inflation as well, uh, and of course uh, what that means when it comes to feed through from the Fed and how these uh, rate cut expectations are already being pushed back. And we're seeing bonds in Australia and New Zealand uh, rally in that catch up to Treasuries as well uh, following those uh, moves over the weekend. Well, you can catch up live and see some of those past interviews in our interactive TV function. That's at TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or the Bloomberg functions we talk about, plus become part of the conversation as well. You can send us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Do check it out. That is at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. through the morning session here. One of the names in particular we're tracking is Nippon Steel. A little bit of pressure for that stock, but actually not the extent of losses we're seeing for Japanese equities so far. Uh, what's behind the move today, or one of the reasons we're looking at it, is because we had United States, States Steel Corp shareholders voting in favour of a more than $14 billion takeover by Nippon Steel. Uh, that is a big mooted deal that's very much in focus, given it's very much in the eye of US regulators. So the fate of whether this takeover goes ahead actually does rest on whether we see uh, US regulators approving it, but it is really mired in a political firestorm, particularly in an election year. So Nippon Steel, as we said, a little bit under pressure so far. Uh, let's shift again to another group of stocks here that we're tracking because market, tra ma market tracker IDC says Apple's iPhone shipments were down nearly 10%. In the first quarter of the year, that's even as the broader smartphone sector rebounded. For more, let's bring in Debbie Wu, who leads our North Asia tech coverage. And Debbie, I'm curious because you've got, yes, weakness for Apple in particular, and we've really seen that already because we've been getting the month-on-month -month figures, at least for China. Still, though, globally, we saw better numbers for, for all uh, smartphones in general. So for Apple suppliers out there, should they be concerned at this point in time? Uh, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, what we are seeing is that the uh, uh, demand for uh, Apple's uh, smartphones have uh, uh, been struggling a little bit, particularly in China, after uh, Huawei uh, launched its um, uh, high-end 5G phone last year. And then uh, we've seen that uh, uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook also uh, made extra efforts to uh, visit China at least twice over the past six months. So you could see that uh, uh, Apple is indeed paying uh, um, extra attention to uh, China, the uh, most important market for the company after uh, the U.S. Uh, Debbie, when it comes to TSMC earnings, just shifting gears a little bit, what are the expectations that we're looking at here? 
Right. So uh, TSMC have already reported a very uh, uh, robust sales numbers for uh, the first quarter. So uh, investors will want to see uh, whether uh, its profit is also being lifted by the uh, uh, growing uh, AI trend. At the same time, the uh, U.S. government just announced a, uh, a huge amount of subsidy for uh, TSMC's uh, new plants in the uh, uh, United States. And then uh, that also means the investors will want to find out more about TSMC's uh, announcement for uh, a additional plant in uh, Arizona, which would make um, would be its uh, uh, third advanced chip making uh, plant in the U.S. What else we're tracking, of course, is is this risk that. Uh, that we could see more of a pushback from some of the chip makers in this part of the world on these calls for the US to continue to try and restrict China's ambitions. How is that going to play out? Um, I think we will uh, need to uh, wait and see. So uh, over the weekend, uh, last week we actually reported that uh, uh, while the Biden administration is seeking to uh, uh, ask allies to uh, further restrict China's access to uh, cutting edge chip technologies, allies including uh, Japan and the Netherlands actually have resisted uh, the U.S. call for that because they want to see the outcome of the uh, elections in November. Bloomberg's Debbie Wu there, who leads our North Asia tech coverage. Let's take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching as markets head into the open in the next uh, half hour or so in Hong Kong and mainland China. We're going to be continuing to uh, look at energy and defence stock, of course, after Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel in retaliation over the weekend. Also watching uh, Chinese builders, in particular China Vanke, after the cash trap developer said it's making plans to resolve liquidity pressure and short-term operational difficulties, Bell. Yeah, and Heidi, continuing to track, of course, how markets are faring in the face of this weekend attack by Iran on Israel. Uh, so far, actually, the picture is looking fairly muted. We're actually seeing a bit of pressure tipped for Taiwanese equities, chi Chinese ones as well at the open. Weaker session on Wall Street into Friday. Bank earnings a little bit of a disappointment, but still uh, U.S. futures a quarter percent to the upside here. Tracking, of course, what we see for the Japanese yen, not really acting as much of a safe haven, but trading at that 153 mark as we see speculative yen shorts hitting a fresh record high, Heidi. Coming up in the next hour, we get more analysis when it comes to the escalation in the Middle East. The University of Melbourne is with us. Goldman Sachs telling us why they're seeing that tactical stance on Chinese stocks reviewed.